I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and I am ecstatic that you're here this week. We have such a very special guest that I, I'm so excited to talk to. This is Margaret Carey. She is the original, I'm, I'm gonna try this close here, the original, model, li, the ori she's gotta help me, the original live action model reference, reference model for Tinkerbell. For Disney's Tinkerbell. For Disney's Tinkerbell, and here she is, Margaret Carey, how are you? I'm peachy keen, couldn't be better. What a pleasure to have you on the show. It was so nice of you to ask. Well, uh, you know, I think you've met one of my friends, Bob West, who is the original oh, voice of Barney. Of course, of course. Yes, voiceover, I do that too. I did about <laughs> 600 cartoons with voiceover. Had loads of fun doing that. But I think Tinkerbell is probably the one that gets the doors open for me more than anything else. Well, my goodness. What an iconic character, and for you to be involved in the original is so special. Yes, it is. It is still amazing to me how much she means to people, and I try to keep it going. I mean, uh, she's such a wonderful character. She developed over the years into this wonderful character that people just love, and so I just love people right back, and it seems to work. <laughs> well, I, I want to kind of start at the beginning because we've got time to talk here. So how did you get into show business? Well, <clears throat> I was adopted when I was three and a half because my mother passed away. And I was adopted by two people who were old enough to be my grandparents. They were 54 years old when they adopted me. They'd never seen a little three and a half year old in a household before. But my mother and father said, well, let's put her to work. I mean, there are people like Shirley Temple and all the other little cute little girls. Why not her? And after all, I was born May 11th, 1929, and I caused the depression. I'm sure I did. No, 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 I did. I did. I did. <laughs> so uh, it's only right that I should go to work. And I've been working all that time. I'm 92, just had my birthday in May. Happy birthday. And I have five shows lined up to do. Just got back from two of them. Love that. I love that. I love that. So what was your per your first professional job? It was Midsummer Night's Dream at Warner Brothers. And guess what? what? I played a fairy. <laughs> I was as cute as a bug. I mean, <laughs> running around here and running around there, not knowing anything that was going on. Neither did my mother. And most of the Hollywood mothers with us, there were lots of other little fairies. We didn't know what was going on. We just paid attention to what they said. And we found out that they wanted to hire our cast of little kids who were, say, six years old, going on 32, that knew how to keep their mouths shut and pay attention and do what they were supposed to. And, and you did it. I did it. I did it. And it was it was um, the most unusual kind of childhood. Let me tell you something. Please I went do. on to be in 37 different major motion pictures, nothing very big in the motion pictures. But I moved into television where I went, did much better. But um, I worked on a movie called um, National Velvet yeah. with Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. And about four months ago, I'm 91 years old now, four months ago. And I get a call from the UK that they are doing a show called Hollywood Icons for their, what we call public broadcasting here, this channel. Yes. And they heard that I knew about being a child actress. And I said, whoopsie, do I know about being a child actress? I certainly <laughs> do. And then I said, you know that I worked in that movie and I doubled Elizabeth on several different of the shots. Um, that they had coming up where you couldn't see her face, but you could see the rest of her. 
oh, really? How did that go? I said, well, you've got to remember that when you have children in a movie or on TV, it's going to cost you a lot more money because at least at that time, and I don't think they've changed it, we could only work 20 minutes after, out of the hour, hour that we had, and we could only work three hours before the camera. So to get a double that could do the same scene and keep your actor busy in school or whatever it is, that worked. Well, they called up and they said, we've decided we would like for you to be a contributor. What's that? Well, we're going to send the cameraman to your place in Sarasota. And then I will be, this lady said, I will be on Zoom from the UK, from North London, and I will direct what you're saying. So I just, can you imagine who else would do things like that? <laughs> it was just, we had a wonderful time. They found out a lot about being a child actor. I didn't like it, I didn't dislike it, is what I did. And um, when they uh, came in and uh, when they asked me, from the director from North London asked me, Elizabeth Taylor said one time that they stole her childhood. What do you think about that? And I said, first of all, I don't think Elizabeth said that. And second of all, I said, how could you do that? When you ask, how did you like your childhood? Your question is, as compared to what? That's right. really bad. And fortunately, I was talented and really, really enjoyed it. So I went on into television from then. And I did, oh, I did one big movie with Eddie Cantor, where it was If You Knew Susie, I played his daughter, mm -hmm. did a big dance number because I'm a dancer. I still dance at 92. I still tap dance. Now, that, so what type of dance? Well, that one, I danced on top of a table and jumped down and did oh. a split and then jumped up. Like, I don't know how they talked me into it. <laughs> But they did, and at 18, I, um, I uh, graduated high school. And as a matter of fact, as you know, if you're in show business, I got a call from the vice principal of a school that I never heard of before, John Marshall High School, I think it's called, because I went to a girl's school and I went to uh, studio school. Could I come over and do two tap dances at the graduation? Uh, proclamation time and my dad says sure she can <laughs> and so that's what I did and that's how I got my diploma but it six um, 18 is very important too because it has to do with being young in show business at least then I told the people over at UK that one of the things that we really always needed as a child actor, particularly a girl, but it could be a boy. And I said, I'm going to use an old fashioned word. I don't think you've ever heard of men called wolves before, mm -hmm. but that's what they were called then when they were looking at every young thing that came along and how they were going to get involved with that, how they could, and we had more wolves on the MGM studio lot. <laughs> I mean, I thought they all howled. So I was very protected by her, uh, my mother. And the lady asked me, the director asked me, well, it said about Elizabeth Taylor's mother that she was really mean and tough with the studio, didn't give a darn and so on and so forth. Well, I did it. I turned off my own clock. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's exciting. That's exciting. Anyway, uh, so they said that she was tough and so on. And I said, listen, with all those wolves around me and all those agents trying to, to step in and, and get her contract and so on and so forth, if I had been in Elizabeth's place, I would have been thrilled to have her mother there. Oh, what they didn't know that. Our mothers kept us so close that I'm sure that when Elizabeth married Nikki Hilton when she was 18, that she knew nothing about the facts of life. None of us did. Right. It was quite a time. But I was going over to, into television at that time, falling in love with it. Making motion pictures is 
so dull <laughs> and so long and so dark in that big sound stage. Mm -hmm. Of course, except for the time when I got the call, I was working at um, Fox on a big movie as an assistant dance director. And I got the call from my agent. Would you like to hear about how I got cast as Tinkerbell? I absolutely would love to hear that. Well, I'm not letting you do any talking. Why don't you say something in between <laughs> and then lead me up to it as only a host of a talk show can do. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm curious. Did, so what did you think when you got into TV after being in film? Did you like that experience a little bit better? I loved television. What you did was right then. It's like doing what we're doing here. There may be a little editing, but it's out there. It's right. out there. And I had some friends in the movies that they would do a big movie and they would send it to one editor and then they would change that and then they would go back and shoot them all. And maybe a year and a half later, the movie would come out. And of course, their career depended upon people seeing them. So television, uh, I was at W6XAO. It was before it even had call letters. And it turned into KTLA Channel 5. <laughs> I had my own television show on Channel wow. 13 called Teletina Reporter. And then I was doing 172 shows for ABC Network as wow. Charlie Ruggles' daughter on The Ruggles Show, the first family sitcom that they did. Wow. At the same time, uh, I did... Uh, we were working on everything there. You know, we didn't know what was coming. Was television going to win? Was cinema going to win? Right. Was radio going to win? You know, what was going to win? So we were doing everything. And and how many networks were on at that time? Do you know? Uh, yes, uh, there were four and one of them dropped out. Okay. Uh, there was NBC, CBS. There was a mutual broadcasting company. And then there was ABC, which we called the Almost Broadcasting Company because it was so new. We cleaned out the bat guano on the stage that we worked on. Oh, and wow. It, it, I, <laughs> we didn't personal, somebody else did. But it, it, was, it was quite amazing and such fun, such fun. We had uh, uh, three sets on the big sound stage. And the cameras would go from one set to the next set to the next set for the different shows. And um, there was a chef, Boyardee, I think was the name of Okay. Close, anyway, who would forget that there was live show, there were live shows going on. And he would come in singing at the top of his line an aria from some Italian opera. And this was being recorded as we were doing this very dramatic scene. It was hilarious and wonderful. I did 172 shows without a break. With, and we did them twice. So how many, were you recording once a week or a couple no, shows a week? Recorded, we recorded two of them once a week. Yes. Okay. Forget, one for uh, the West East Coast. Okay. Yes, and then uh, one for the West Coast. I think it's just the opposite. I don't remember. I'm 92, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You're doing really well. Your memory is really good. <laughs> and then I, w I did a big uh, dancing show for them with uh, Tommy Noonan and Peter, Peter Marshall called Let There Be Stars. And while I was doing that, uh, we finished the Ruggles show and I was over at Fox, and here's the big part. I get a call one day, we're doing a big dance number, uh, Gloria to Haven and June Haver and um, Dan, oh dear, the other, he's trying to dance, wonderful man. Anyway, we're, we're doing this big for, um, I'll get by is the name, and I get a call from my agent. I'm about 18, 19, right around in there. Can you get off work tomorrow because I want to send you on a, uh, an uh, uh, interview. It's for a three and a half inch Sprite who doesn't talk. And I said, oh, you know, Carol, uh, I don't really, there, uh, it's a big deal. We're getting 
ready to shoot it. And she said, it's a Disney. I said, I'll be there at 6 a.m. <laughs> uh, and that's the way everybody felt They really, that I knew. That Anything everybody, to do with Disney, everyone wanted to be part of it. To work at Disney would have been. And you may, you probably know how small the uh, Disney studio lot is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's small as compared to any place else. So uh, that night, I put together a pantomime of a little boy, about nine years old, fixing breakfast, you know, juggling eggs, dropping them and, and trying to get away and all that sort of thing, because I knew that I had to do more than say, hi, cast me in the role. But did they give you much description? I mean, did you I'm have not, much information going none, into the audition? No. None. Not a bit. And uh, so I got there and lo and behold, the man with the clipboard had my name. <gasps> Showed me where to park on the lot <gasps> and where I should go in the building on the third floor. And I went up to see this man who turned out to be one of the great geniuses that I've ever known in my life. His name was Mark Davis, M-A-R-C Davis one of the great animators and artists of Disney, one of the nine old men. And he did Cruella de Vil, he did Mr. and Mrs. Wow. Dorothy, he did Flower and Thumper, he did uh, things for, um, um, what, what's it, what's, what's the one where she turns into, a pumpkin turns into a character? Oh, Cinderella, right? Yes, he did Cinderella. Um, and then he quit that, and of course he did Tinkerbell, uh, but he quit that and switched over to designing and designed Pirates of the Caribbean, wow. Haunted Mansion, and uh, I mean, but and the sweetest man. Just the, so I walked into his office and I carried my little uh, a forty-five player with me. You remember forty-fives with me? I do. Okay, so I walked in and I set it down, and he's like, oh, and there, up on the wall, up on his wall were all these sketches of this little tiny pixie. And one of them, she's looking over and I thought, I, and of course he wanted to sit down and talk to me and I told him what I, what I could do. So I, bless his heart, we could not get the, um, the uh, 45 player to play. Okay. So he jiggled with it. He called the Uber director to come down and see me and they jiggled with it. And he actually got down on his hands and knees to find a plug to plug. You wouldn't find that in any other studio in Hollywood. <laughs> I was in love with both of them, you understand. So I did that and I said, well, here's the scene that we want you to do. And have you seen the movie, Peter Pan? Yes. Okay. Do you remember the nursery scene? Yes. Where, where Tinkerbell comes in and she goes in all of the pockets and everything looking. For, um, and then she stops. And then she lands on a mirror, a big hand mirror that was on Wendy's dresser. And she's looking down at herself and she sees, I played it as if she sees herself for the very first time. Who would have a mirror in Neverland? You know? <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm doing that. And then, of course, she gets angry when her hips are too big. Then she stamps off. And I stamped out almost into the hallway. <laughs> and uh, they liked that. They, they told me later, uh, Mark told me later, that one of the things he liked, that I was seeing down through the carpet, which I was, in my mind, was a mirror, and back up again. Now, they've changed it a great deal now, mm -hmm. uh, Carrie, with giving it, well, she was preening. She didn't know how to preen. She's only about nine or 10 years old. Right. So she was just surprised. Is that me? So, well, time moves on. Anyhow. Right. So it was either then or the next weekend they called up and said, would it be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday? I have to tell you, nobody has ever asked me in the business before or since, would it be convenient to come by? It's be there. I've been there in the business for 30 years and I've never had that. No one has See, ever said that to me. <laughs> well, what, what was going on was I was under contract to come to them 
when we could both find the time because he was sketching out the next scene. So I was also working at Fox, finishing that up. I was also doing my TV show and uh, radio. So, so it, was, it was like that all around. So anyway, um, we went on a sound stage and he told me, he showed me what Tinkerbell's theme was. And it happened to be the mirror. And so be before I did anything, I stepped out in front of the big 35 millimeter camera. We had about 12 uh, on the crew and all the lights and everything. And I said, Mr. Davis, see how long ago that was we call people Mr. Mr. Davis, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be ditzy like Debbie Boo? Or do you want it to be above it all like Queen of the Fairies? And he said very sweetly and softly, Margaret, we want her to be you. Oh. And I said, gosh, golly, I think I can do that. <laughs> so he never told me what he wanted the acting to be, but just I had to hit my, my marks and where that, that was going to be. And he never gave me any um, direction except once. He said, I wanted to look huffy. I said, how puffy? And he, that genius, took a piece of paper this big and a sketch, and he sketched the face of Tinkerbell in about 30 seconds, turned it around, and there is what he wanted. Wow. <laughs> I, do, I knew he was a genius, and he was a dear man. We met many, many, many times, uh, signing things and and with his wonderful wife. And she uh, made all of the costumes. She was a costume designer. She made all wow. the costumes for Pirates of the Caribbean. She made costumes even before that for It's a Small World. She wow. was a wonderful lady. So had you done anything like this before? No. I was 19 years old. I could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> also, I had I had so much behind me of all the work that I had done all of those years that it was, you know, when I was in our gang, mm -hmm. I was in eight of those. And I was sort of a blur. I, did, I never had a name, but I was there. And it was run over here and smile. So what kind of a smile? A happy smile? A scared smile? You know, you just, it, it, comes part of you. Look over there and cry with tears, without tears. <laughs> and then you realize the difference between comedy and drama. And when I worked in uh, Rebecca, I, uh, I was skipping rope in one of the scenes in Rebecca. And we weren't supposed to look at this huge car that was driving up. It was an interior, exterior kind of a scene. And uh, but like you're not supposed to look because that's nobody's looking. Nobody in the whole, all the extras and um, atmosphere people are not looking purposefully. So you do it with your eyes as it goes by, even though you're jumping around. You just it sort of becomes part of you. It still has. Now, when you were doing this, was were you acting with anyone else, or was it just no, you? I was all by myself. And what was wonderful, I didn't have to learn any lines. Now, when I when Mark asked me to be the redheaded mermaid in the lagoon, which I did, I had lines, and I worked with uh, two others, the other um, mermaids, <clears throat> and uh, so we had to play off of each other. I'm I'm sitting here desperately thinking, trying to think of her name. You know, at 40, at 92, can't even remember my own age. At 92, the names come and go. And she is the great voiceover of uh, oh, I'm getting worse at it. <laughs> uh, you're doing great. Um, what is her name? She's so famous. She played the dark-haired mermaid. And we both decided that day, along with Connie Hilton, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, uh, we both, we all decided, why were we fighting 
to get parts in front of a camera. Why are we just going into voiceover? And uh, oh, <laughs> the people who are watching this are trying to tell me, I'm sure. <laughs> trying to tell me too. <laughs> Bullwinkle, and she is, who was with Bullwinkle? The, the company? Rocky. Rocky, she's Rocky. Oh. It's a June Foray. Oh, for heaven's sakes, the great June Foray played was playing a dark character. Thank you for your thoughts, everybody. I could feel that. Yes, I really could. And uh, of course, she went on to be one of the great. Uh, she played um, Mulan's grandmother in Mulan. And I would tease her unmercifully when we saw each other. We would just give each other a terrible time doing voices. And I said, June, the greatest part that you ever did was Mulan's grandmother. And you had the greatest line in the movie. She said, I did. I said, yes. Do you remember Mulan came back and had all the medals on a horse with a sword? She was victorious and so on. And the grandmother's line in it. Betty, you should have come back as a, bring us a man. And, <laughs> and June said, I said that. I said, yes, you did. It's my favorite. So every time I bring you a man, that's what we would say to each other. It, it's been a great life. It really has. So how long did, because I'm so curious about all this, how long did it take to film all of your Tinkerbell parts? It went over nine months. Wow. Yes, because I came, I left. One of the funny things you might like to, a little side bit. Sure. By the way, may I be, may I be marketing? Of course. All of these stories are in my book, Tinkerbell Talks, which you can get at my website, tinkerbelltalks.net, or you can get it at Amazon. I don't sign for Amazon, but I do sign up for, for my, my website. But Tinkerbell, there's a whole story about their pictures of me meeting Walt Disney. So we're all- And we, we, Margaret, we will promote that as well. We'll put all your sites you. and we will promote that and get that out so people can get this wonderful book. Well, um, Walt Disney, um, I'm, I'm in the center of, this, of the stage uh, with Walt Disney uh, mm. at, at the studio. Let me go back. I'm at the center of the stage and I'm working there with the camera and all the rest. And uh, one day the big door opens, you know, the, the one that lets all the trucks in because I have no lines to, to uh, match. Right. And, and uh, in walk all these people and I could see the shadow of them. And let's see, we're gonna try. You can see it, I think, down there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And Buddy Ebsen walked in first, and you couldn't miss Buddy Ebsen. <laughs> and they all walked over to the wall where I was working in that sound stage. And they were planning and thinking, and they were figuring out um, how big the, the character should be with a human being. Well, it was the beginning of animatronics and the little man. And uh, when they would finish talking, Walt Disney would walk over to talk to Mark Davis and see how it was going with Tinkerbell. And the, and the cameraman was a friend of his and he came over and I was invited to talk with him. Mm. And I'll tell you, I was like a school kid. You see, <laughs> I had been trained since I'm four years old that nobody ever sees the head of the studio. And if you do, you're supposed to curtsy. <laughs> you're supposed to just stand in awe because the head of a studio is like God. And I'm standing here looking at the head of a studio. So we chatted just a little bit and I'm, I'm like a schoolgirl. And he leaves very nice and he comes at another time it happens. So this time, I'm, again, I'm, I'm better, better prepared. <laughs> And the third time that it happened, suddenly I said, hey, wait a minute, that's Walt Disney. I was only thinking of it as the head of a studio. That's how all of those things could get in your mind. So I had just spoken to, uh, I don't know, Jerry Geronimi, the Uber director, or Mark Davis, or saying that I went to school with the uh, Disney girls, Sharon and, uh, and Diane. 
you know, just a conversation. And I don't know, I guess they told him because I'm standing there and Mr. Didley says to me, I understand you went to school with my daughters. I, I went almost blank. I said, yes, Sharon and Diane, they were in different classes, but yes, Monticello School for Girls. And he said, oh, I remember that place. And, and I had no comeback. And he, <laughs> he finished and he, he came back and said something to me just went back. He said, I think they must have liked you or something like that. And I thought, you are a handsome man, slim, trim, and you are a gentleman. And he walked away. And the fourth time, I was pretty good at, at talking with him. So, and why was Walt Disney using Soundstage One when I was using Soundstage One? Mm -hmm. Why didn't he have his own? You know the answer? No. And he had one Soundstage. Oh. <laughs> That's all they had at that wow. time. So that's how I got the job. I loved wow. it. I loved so what was it like when it came out and you got to see this the amazing movie? Uh, I was I was delighted. Uh, I was not invited to the premiere. I was invited to the second premiere. Okay. But you see, it was interesting because the first posters that they put out for Peter Pan with Peter standing up like this, you know, the tall posters that they did. Mm -hmm. Tinkerbell is not on the poster. They never thought that she was going to be anything. As a matter of fact, there was a mix up with the publicity department, uh, public relations department, or the media department, let's put it that way. Because at one time, Tinkerbell was going to start out as a uh, with dark hair and as I understand and then they changed that to red a redhead but the lady who ran Technicolor one whose name is always up um, I'd be great if I could remember her name but <laughs> that's the way it goes anyway uh, they said the red hair does not play well against all the greenery Makes sense. So they changed her to a blonde, but they forgot to tell the public relations media department. So all the little magazines that go out to the um, to the movie houses, right? Said, the little redhead is it runs in and out, and that's the way they started it. See, Tinkerbell wasn't going to be anything, huh. and uh, everybody loved her, but you realize that Mr. Disney never made a sequel. So she was, Tinkerbell was going to be put on the shelf. And that was that. So, okay, and along with all the other things. Well, they came to Mr. Disney, as I understand it, the board and the people in the know, through his brother, to say, if you're going to make this park, whatever that is, in a place called Anaheim, uh, we're afraid of it. We don't think it's going to work. And we don't want you to use any of the characters that are known for Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, any of them. Now, can you imagine that? But, oh. but Walt Disney was smart enough, as I understand it from people who were there, was smart enough to say, I understand where they're coming from. So he told his brother after he thought it over, tell him I'm bringing that Tinkerbell and Jiminy Cricket, will that satisfy them? And he said, yes. So when it opened, Tinkerbell was on every ticket, on every banner, every place. And so was Jiminy Cricket. And the first ride that they did really, uh, one of the first rides was Peter Pan. And that was the reason because Tinkerbell was being presented. But Tinker. Just so many people can go to a park and, you know, and know about Tinkerbell. But when the time when Walt Disney ran out of money and they went to ABC and said, would you like to put in about $6 million and be a partner in the, in the park? And we will give you, I'm probably quoting this incorrectly, so I'm not precise. Um, we will give you an hour show every Sunday from our walls 
and all the things and the best thing that we can do and I'm sure all the promotion that they could do. So ABC said yes, NBC turned them down and I think CBS turned them down. I can't, another. And I remember this, I remember this very well. So anyway, and I think it's Walt Disney that did it. <laughs> I've never found out, but he talked to Tinkerbell who took everyone on an adventure every Sunday and she became part of their lives. And that's how she became so popular. And what did you think when all of a sudden th this character, this movie you'd done and all of a sudden this character is becoming really popular and it's just continued to grow over the years? Well, not much. Um, uh, you know, I knew many, many people who love uh, fans and who knew me through the park and so on. But a thing happened that was called um, Comic Con. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And celebrity shows. And suddenly celebrity shows popped up every place. And suddenly little old Tinkerbell was a celebrity at, at the shows. I have been to shows that have been rather a disappointment because of many different reasons. And there's always a line at Tinkerbell, always a line lined up for me to sign. She's amazing. I, in my book, there's a story about a lady who came to me at one of the shows and she was shaking, she was quivering. I said, what, what is the, she said, I never thought I could thank somebody who saved my life. And I'm thinking, oh, hmm, I got a live one here or something, you know, I'm looking <laughs> around. Right. But she, but she said, no. She said, I weighed almost 300 pounds. I had to have both knees replaced. And of course, I'm looking at this wonderful woman who's standing here 30, I'd say 35, 38 years old with this wonderful short bob, curls and dark hair. She looked adorable. And true, this could be. So I said, oh, well, that's wonderful. She said, what I did was I started to get so depressed that all I could think was horrible thoughts. And I thought, who thinks happy thoughts? Tinkerbell. So she had Tinkerbell tattooed on her leg. And every time that she thought an unhappy thought, she'd look, no, 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 happy thoughts. And I'm still thinking, you know, I'm, I'm listening. Well, her 12 year old daughter was there with her and she said that's exactly what happened and this lady who's in the book you'll see the picture of the tattoo as a matter of fact is one of three no one of four people women particularly who've come up and told me that tinkerbell saved their lives i mean that's what's important that's what's important and um and i get invited every place i've been to london I've been to Toronto, I've been to New York, I've been to about seven different states. I have five more shows to do, one of which is in Michigan. I've never been there for her. Uh, that's coming in November. It's a wonderful place. It is. It uh, is. I was just there actually in Michigan. Okay. We have family up there. So now I'm gonna be quiet and you're gonna talk for a little while. Well, this I love hearing this, and I love hearing what you're just saying because, you know, my I played uh, the role of Barney for 22 years, yeah. and I got that opportunity as well yes. to to touch people's lives. Yes, and it's such a gift, and and you don't realize it a lot of times. You're just you're part of this character, and you love it, and you you yes. love people, and next thing you know, you realize that you're touching people's lives. It's really something very special. All the stories, the individual stories we could tell. I'll yes. tell you the individual story. Okay. I was going to shut up, but I didn't. Anyway, no, I love hearing your stories. Um, I was in uh, North Carolina. Okay. I did a show up there. And my husband, my brand new husband and I were had gotten off a boat that took us around and showed us the bay up there <clears throat> at Hilton Head. And uh, on board the, the boat, my husband found some people who's, who had relatives who were in the same outfit in World War II as he was. So they got to talking about that. Over here on this side, 
was this wonderful family, grandparents, who had two little grandkids and this little grandson who was having a miserable day. He wouldn't look at anybody. He wouldn't turn, turn his back. He didn't want to hear anybody. He didn't want to look at the water. He just was having a terrible day. Well, we got up finally halfway through the time and we, we went to the uh, bow of the boat and we sat down and talked to other people. When we got off the boat, um, my husband has me by the hand and we're walking up towards our car. And I hear this little voice say, Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell. And I turn around and there he is. I think his name is Ewan. And he was about this big around and about 11 years old, 10 years old. He said, can I give Tinkerbell a hug? <laughs> if I didn't know, I said, oh, of course you can. And we stood there and hugged each other. I said, you've had a rough day, haven't you? And he goes, oh. And I said, it's going to get better now, right? You've hugged Tinkerbell, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, uh, one more. We gave each other an eye. Off he went. Now, love... that is magic. It is. That is magic. Because, it is. Said, Gary, Gary, I am too tall to be Tinkerbell. <laughs> right? Yeah. She, she is, when, when they describe her, she's, um, she's a, a fairy. Um, uh, she is no bigger than your hand and still growing. She is uh, dressed in a skeletal leaf cut low and square, which shows her figure to best advantage. <laughs> and, that's Tinkerbell. and that's what Mark Davis took and made into this precious, precious little thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I want to talk here while we got a little time about voiceover because you continue to go. Oh, oh, you know Hal Smith? Have you worked with Hal Smith by any chance? He was the drunk Otis on the Andy Griffith Show. I did the Andy Griffith Show. I'm going up to Mayberry in September oh, to Mayberry Days up in Mount Airy. Oh. We have about 6,000 people who come and we have um, um, actors who are dressed. They're wonderful. Tribute actors, I finally get the right word. And I tap dance on stage. And this, that's where I met my husband, my new husband, face to face two years ago up at Mount Airy. Wow. And, uh, and he loves to hear my dialect. Uh, what, which ones do you do particularly? Uh, which voices? Mm -hmm. No, so I don't know if you, I don't do the voice. I was actually in the costume. Yes, I know. Yeah, so so I didn't do the I've never done oh, voices. Do yeah, no, talking? no. So oh. I was I was the one dancing and jumping and doing all of that. I oh, did I that. thought I thought you did the voice. I it's been a long time since I've no. seen the clip of that. No, because we were having because it was so physical, there had to be two people. So there was someone doing the voice. So I was kind of like you were doing with Tinkerbell. I was doing all the movements, and I did it on tour. I did the TV show. And travel the world. Well, it's it's there's there's just nothing like it entertaining. If that's in your blood, if that's what you're doing, and you're doing something that you love. I you know, I could have been the actress who had her throat slit in psycho. Really? I don't think that would have been fun at no. all. No. <laughs> so I just I am so thankful that it's it's Tinkerbell and and look at all the things. All the things that people still see, the Little Rascal, the Lone Ranger, um, the uh, Three Stooges, um, the, um, what well, I've left, left out one, uh, and, and Tinkerbell, and then the movies that you see, and they're all healthy and delightful and fun. And everybody, and everybody keeps seeing them because they turn on YouTube. And right. Amazing. Right. Well, let's let's do all those really quickly. What was it like, Little Rascals? Say again. Little Rascals. What was it like being on that? Oh, the Little Rascals. I was the why did I get this? What 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 is that? It's a camera. Oh, that what that is. And my mother. Oh, my mother was the one. She she would do everything as if I were deaf and dumb, as she would stand and go. <laughs> I 
she would give me all these signs and I'd be standing there watching her instead of paying attention to the one who's coming by. But it turned out that the director of three of the uh, Little Rascals was Gordon Douglas. And when I did the movie with uh, Eddie Cantor, the director was Gordon Douglas. Wow. So it was, it was, it was sort of, really? You mean you come back and you actually see the same people maybe years later? Uh, right. That was amazing to me. <laughs> it took what? And I played, uh, Mr. Cantor decided that he wanted, he's the one who changed my name to Margaret Carey. Oh, okay. Yes. And I will do a dialect for you in a minute, if you, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Uh, so my name was Peggy Lynch, which okay. is an Irish name. But when I was adopted, as everybody else, um, my parents never told me who my, my real folks were or anything. So I, I always sort of knew I was Irish. There was just something about it. I was Irish. And I used to tell this story. And then later on, uh, quite, a, quite often. But let's see if I can do it. <clears throat> this is an Irish poem, Warrior. You know, and they're knocking it back pretty good. They're doing just fine. And they're talking about the troubles in Ireland and all the rest. And he said, I don't know. It's too much trouble to be Irish. And the other one says, oh, yeah, I couldn't say that now. No, it's great to be Irish. Really? Let's go over and ask Patty what he thinks. So they go over to where Patty is sitting there. And he's knocking them back pretty good. He's hunched over. And I said, Patty, is what is it? He says, what would you be if you weren't Irish? I'd be ashamed. So we get <laughs> lost of that. But 50 years later, I found my whole family. Oh. And I can say I'm Irish 100%. No, I have a little Scots in me too. Oh, there you go. Yes, so I knew. <laughs> so we, we did all these all these different, we stand at the microphone doing all these shows, Clutch Cargo, The New Three Stooges, uh, Charlie Weaver, uh, all the cartoons that we were doing for Saturday morning. And uh, for example, I'd, I'd say, how? I'm supposed to do a German accent here. I don't know a German accent. He says, you do not know a German accent. He says, come over here. I will tell you, you have to have a window you have to have a sentence that has a good word in it. I have to have a sentence? He said, yeah. He said, I give you my sentence. My sentence is, she was looking out the window when I saw her. She said, he said, she'll be talking German. I went back, picked up the script, and I could do German. <laughs> That's the way we learned. <laughs> it, oh, it, I love it. And uh, uh, it, it we don't do dialects anymore. They're out of season. Right. And I don't know whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. But all the dialects that I do are broadcast dialects. They're not true dialects. Because if you did a true French dialect, no one could understand them in a, in a cartoon. Right. You, you just have to, you know, you make it just so. You I know you are not with the United States. So you know, it, uh, Oh, it is wonderful place, Kapali. Yeah, that's the kind of thing. What was it like doing the Three Stooges? I did 139 episodes with them, and I'm all right. <laughs> wrong with me. They were adorable. They were just adorable. They were all run by the two wives by uh, Moe's wife, Mrs. Howard, and, uh, and Larry's wife. And they, these two ladies were wonderful. They would sit over, they would have their chairs next to each other and they would start talking to each other very low as if they hadn't seen each other for five years. And if they thought it was taking too long, you would hear one of them say, Moe, Moe, Mo, darling. It's getting late. They do the scene like that and get it done. It was it was just great fun. <clears throat> I have another voice that goes with it because I did okay. all the all the girls' voices in the, uh, that. I did the witch and all the other stuff. But 
<clears throat> we were in recording okay. and Larry has a speech impediment. It's not huge, but it's, it's sort of mushy when he talks. I'm okay. over doing it now a little bit so you can hear it. Well, he had a line as we were recording that said, Mo, do you see the ships that are coming to save us? And Mo said, we can't understand you, Larry. Would you say it so we can understand what you're saying? Oh, I'm sorry, Mo. Okay, roll them. Okay. Mo, do you see the ships that are coming to save us? Is that a lot better? He couldn't hear the difference, and yet he could do it. And he, he many of these things, uh, Larry was always sort of, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the other thing was, if Mo Howard combed his hair back, we could go to lunch with him, and people didn't recognize him. Huh. Yep. It, it was, it was an interesting time. It really, really was. Did you have a favorite project? I don't know how you could, because you did so many oh, iconic things. I was going to say. project is my favorite one. I'm writing a book about what happened to me, about somebody finding me after 70 years and getting married. Congratulations. And That's amazing. Thank you. Yes, it's an amazing story. Do we have time to tell it? We do. OK, if I may. Oh, please. Uh, I have been in. Southern California for 90 years, and on my 90th birthday, I knew I was leaving California. And my friends would say, well, where are you going? I said, I have no idea. I just know I'm leaving. It will happen. The door will open. So about two weeks after my birthday in May, about or three weeks, something like that, in June, I get an email that says, would you like to get in touch with your friend of 70 years ago? His name is Robert Bokey. I remembered Bokey. I remembered him so well. We dated all that time where I was starting to do Tinkerbell and the other things that I was doing. And we dated, I would say maybe eight, 10 times. So I said it back and said, of course, I, I would love to. And I went over to my poor dilapidated jewelry box and pulled out this little bracelet that he gave me 70 years ago. Wow. And I kept it and my mother's wedding ring. Those are the only two that I kept. I thought, this is interesting. So I got a call from France. He was at the 75th commemoration of D-Day and he was being honored. He was a hero in World War II. And uh, <clears throat> He, he called me and we got to talking and we got to talk. Well, I had all these shows lined up. You understand that we're talking right. we're in June. I mean, I must have had 10 shows lined up to, to do. So I'm getting close to and we're, we're having a lovely time chatting. We just are. And I know I'm going to Mount Airy, North Carolina. And Robert lived, lives in South Carolina. And somehow I'm thinking maybe he can come there. I don't know how to fly in. So I suggested it to him and he said, well, I'll see what I can do, but I have to have my 94th birthday party first. I said, fine. So he had his 94th birthday. And a couple of weeks later, he gets in his car and drives eight hours wow. to Mount Airy, right almost into Virginia. And that we're, the reason we're in Mount Airy, that is uh, Andy Griffith's birthplace is Mount Airy. And they took Main Street and used a lot of things in Main Street for the show. And we have about 60,000 fans all over the United States that we wow. know. So it, it's a big deal. So anyway, we were, um, they have a golf tournament and then they have a big dinner. Well, a lot of the stuff happened and I said, Meet me in the clubhouse where we're setting up for the dinner and I'm signing autographs there at four o'clock. You come at five, and we'll all be ready. So he comes walking in. I look at him and he looks at me and I swear to you, it was love at second sighting. We just looked at each other, we kissed and the newspaper man was there and took pictures of it. Uh. The next morning, this is what I love this one. 
the next morning, he said, we have to have dinner, uh, breakfast together. So we met at the Cracker Barrel, yes, okay. it's called. And he said, the opening line, he said, I have to buy a new house for you. <laughs> said, he said, well, I can't live where I am because nothing happens there. You need people. You need people. So I'm going to have to do that. But he added, he said, <clears throat> It has to be near a Costco's. And I said, wait a minute, you're a member of Costco? He said, yes. I said, do you have a Costco card? He said, yes. You will let me use your Costco card? He said, yes. I said, will you marry me? And he said, we'll have to put all of that together. <laughs> so, so he went back home and started looking for a house. And he went to Sarasota and he bought a beautiful home. And uh, then I was com completing all of my shows, taking no more shows then. <clears throat> and the Disney Anna Fan Club, which is huge, was, was putting on one of their, their, their famous uh, uh, dinners. And six months before, they had asked me to be the speaker. And I had said, yes. So that was when I knew about that I had to be there. Well, I thought, you get married and they, somebody else is throwing you a party. How good can that be? So I figured it out. And we could get married on St. Valentine's Day at the Little Brown Church in the Valley in Studio City. And I figured there's going to be about 10 of us. Ended up there with 41. Disney opened up their gates to all of us and we went all over it. They showed us everything. And then the next day we got married. And then the next day we went to the big party at the smokehouse up across the street from Warner Brothers. And then the next day at Walt's Barn, which is a beautiful place in Griffith Park, right next to the live steamers. And we had 400 people there. And so many producers I knew came. It was, it was wonderful. Um, and they met, they met Robert and people came and we signed and so on. And the next day he flew me off to Sarasota. I drove up and to the house at nine o'clock at night. I took a look at it. It's beautiful. Walked in and can you believe it was completely decorated. All the furniture was there. Everything was there. And then he said, I've got to make you dinner. He's a cook. <laughs> <laughs> And he is so brilliant. And then the book and, and the things, his stories are, some of them are blood curdling of what he had to do in the war. And mm -hmm. but before that, wonderful stories. So we decided that the book is going to be called Love at Second Sighting. I love it. Yeah. I love it. What a wonderful story. It is, it is, it is. Only God, I really believe. I mean, oh, I forgot to tell you how he found me. I okay. So he's going on tour with all these people before he goes to o uh, Omaha Beach and they get on the ship, but they have to fly into Amsterdam. So he is driving by to see what Amsterdam is like. And way over there is a store that says Tinkerbell's Toys. And he turns to his friends and said, did I ever tell you that I dated Tinkerbell 70 years ago? And they said, Let's find her. Wow. They found my website. They found, you know, all the things about me. And he said, she won't remember me. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> Beautiful story. It's your turn to talk. No, I, I tell you, this has just been such a pleasure, Margaret. Oh, see this pin? I hope. Yes. Okay. He bought that for my birthday. Oh, that my beautiful? gosh. Boy, you have had uh, you've had a blessed life, and I, you've touched so many people's lives. Yes, it, it's just it's wonderful, and I thank God every single day. I really do. It's just amazing, uh, the wonderful characters that Disney has all over the place. I have a dear friend who just did a new painting, uh, a commission of Tinkerbell, yeah. not for me, but for somebody else, and he was telling me. The commissions that he gets, and he is, there are many of them. He's about two years um, behind in his commission. The two that he that he gets requests for Mickey Mouse, 
and Tinkerbell. I mean, that's amazing after 69 yes. years. It is amazing. Yes. Well, it's an well, iconic that's character. Mark Davis. That is Mark Davis. He's the one who imbued her with this absolutely incredible, delightful. Well, you love her. I call her beguiling. <laughs> you love her if she's bad. You see, you love her if she's good. <laughs> Well, it has just been a pleasure talking to you, Margaret. And to you. And you're more, more listening to me than, than talking with me. I just got going. No, I, you have so many beautiful, wonderful stories. I was so excited to talk to you and to hear all these great stories. Well, I'm delighted to do it. And I love to tell them because they're very, very special. And I think Disney is very special. And I, th I know Tinkerbell is. So well, and I know you are too. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for being on the show. So here's uh, faith and trust. And here's a whole bunch of pixie dust. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open and you find your purple road. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>